Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another episode of The Reading Corner with Moose J. Pat. What's oh, me, in case you're wondering. Today, we're reading Chapter 25 of Queen of Sorcery by David Eddings. And as always, you should support the original work by buying the original book. Chapter 25. For the next several days, they all remained aboard Greldick's ship, waiting for word from Silk and Mr. Wolf. Sinedra recovered from her indisposition and appeared on deck wearing a pale-colored dryad tunic, which seemed to Garion to be only slightly less revealing than the gowns worn by Nyasin women. When he rather stiffly suggested that she ought to put on a few more clothes, however, she merely laughed at him. With a single-mindedness that made him want to grind his teeth, she returned to the task of teaching him to read and write. They sat together in an out-of-the-way spot on deck, poring over a tedious book on Talnadrin diplomacy. The whole business seemed to Garion to be taking forever, though in fact his mind was very quick and he was learning surprisingly fast. Sinedra was too thoughtless to compliment him, though she seemed to await his next mistake almost breathlessly, delighting, it seemed, in each opportunity to ridicule him. Her proximity and her light spicy perfume distracted him as they sat close beside each other, and he perspired as much from their occasional touch of hand or arm or hip as he did from the climate. Because they were both young, she was intolerant and he was stubborn. The sticky, humid heat made them both short-tempered and irritable, so the lessons erupted in bickering more often than not. When they arose one morning, a black square-rigged Nyishan ship rocked in the river, current at the nearby wharf. A foul, evil kind of reek carried to them from her on the fitful morning breeze. What's that smell? Garion asked one of the sailors. Slaver, the sailor answered grimly, pointing at the Nyasin ship. You can smell them twenty miles away when you're at sea. Garion looked at the ugly black ship and shuddered. Beric and Mandarolan drifted across the deck and joined Garion at the rail. Looks like a scow, Beric said at the Nyasin ship, his voice heavy with contempt. He was stripped to the waist, and his hairy torso ran with sweat. It's a slave ship, Garion told him. It smells like an open sewer, Beric complained. A good fire would improve it tremendously. A sorry trade, my lord Beric, Mandarolan said. Nyasa hath dealt in human misery for untold centuries. Is that a Drasnian wharf? Beric asked with narrowed eyes. No, Garen answered. The sailors say that everything on that side's Nyasin. That's a shame, Beric growled. A group of male shirted men in black cloaks walked out onto the wharf where the slave ship was moored and stopped near the vessel's stern. Uh-oh, Beric said. Where's Hedder? He's still below, Garen replied. What's the matter? Keep an eye out for him. There are Murgos. The shaven head Nyasin sailor pulled open a hatch on their ship and barked a few rough orders down into the hold. Slowly, a line of dispirited looking men came up. Each man wore an iron collar, and a long chain fastened them together. Menderalan stiffened and began to swear. What's wrong? Beric asked. A rendishman! the knight exclaimed. I had heard of this, but I did not believe it! Heard of what? An ugly rumor hath persisted in Arendia for some years, Mandarolan answered, his face white with rage. We are told that some of our nobles have, upon occasion, enriched themselves by selling their serfs to the Nyasins. Looks like it's more than a rumor, Beric said. There, Mandarolan growled. See the crest upon the tunic of that one there. It's the crest of Votoral. I know the Baron of Votoral for a notorious spendthrift, but had not thought him dishonorable. Upon my return to Arendia, I will denounce him publicly. What's good's that gonna do? Beric asked. He'll be forced to challenge me, Mandarolan said grimly. I will prove his villainy upon his body. Beric shrugged. Serf or slave, what's the difference? Those men have rights, my lord, Mandarolan stated. Their lord is required to protect them and care for them. The oath of knighthood demands it of us. The vile transaction hath stained the honor of every true orendish knight. I shall not rest until I have bereft the foul baron of his miserable life. 
Interesting idea, Barrack said. Maybe I'll go with you. Hedar came up on deck, and Barrack moved immediately to his side and began talking quietly to him, holding one of his arms firmly. Make them jump around a bit, one of the Mergos ordered harshly. I want to see how many are lame. A heavy shouldered Danaeusin and coiled a long whip and began to flick it deftly at the legs of the chained men. The slaves began to dance feverishly on the wharf beside the slave ship. Dog's blood! Mandarolan swore, and his knuckles turned white as he gripped the railing. Easy, Garion warned. Aunt Paul says we're supposed to stay pretty much out of sight. It cannot be borne! Mandarolan cried. The chain that bound the slaves together was old and pitted with rust. When one slave tripped and fell, a link snapped, and the man found himself suddenly free. With an agility bored of desperation, he rolled quickly to his feet, took two st quick steps, and plunged off the wharf into the murky waters of the river. This way, man! Mandarolan called to the swimming slave. The burly Nyasin with the whip laughed harshly and pointed at the escaping slave. Watch, he told the Burgos. Stop him, you idiot, one of the Murgos snapped. I paid good gold for him. It's too late, the Nyasin looked on with an ugly grin. Watch. The swimming man suddenly shrieked and sank out of sight. When he came up again, his face and arms were covered with the slimy foot-long leeches that infested the river. Screaming, the struggling man tore at the writhing leeches, ripping out chunks of his own flesh in his efforts to pull them off. The Murgos began to laugh. Garion's mind exploded. He gathered himself with an awful concentration, pointed out one hand to the wharf just beyond their own ship, and said, Be there! He felt an enormous surge, as if some vast tide were rushing out of him, and he reeled almost senseless against Mandarolin. The sound inside his head was deafening. The slave, still writhing and covered with oozing leeches, was suddenly lying on the wharf. A wave of exhaustion swept over Garion. If Mandarolin had not caught him, he would have fallen. Where did he go? Beric demanded, still staring at the turbulent spot on the surface of the river where the slave had been an instant before. Did he go under? Wordlessly, and with a shaking head, Mandarolin pointed at the slave, who still lay weakly struggling on the Drasnian wharf about twenty yards in front of the bow of their ship. Beric looked at the slave, then back at the river. The big man blinked with surprise. A small boat with four Nyasins at the oars put out from the other wharf and made deliberately toward Greldic's ship. A tall Murgo stood in the bow, his scarred face angry. You have my property, he shouted across the intervening water. Return the slave to me at once. Why don't you come and claim him, Murgo? Beric called back. He released Hedder's arm. The Algar moved to the side of the ship, stopping only to pick up a long boat hook. Will I be unmolested? The Mergo asked a bit doubtfully. Why don't you come alongside and we'll discuss it? Beric suggested pleasantly. You're denying me my rights to my own property, the Mergo complained. Not at all, Beric told him. Of course, there might be a fine point of law involved here. This wharf is Drasnian territory, and slavery isn't legal in Drasnia. Since that's the case, the man's not a slave anymore. I'll get my men, the Murgo said. We'll take the slave by force if we have to. I think we'd have to look on that as an invasion of Alorn territory. Beric warned with a great show of regret. In the absence of our Drasnian cousins... We'd almost be compelled to take steps to defend their war for them. What do you think, Mandarolin? Thy perceptions are most acute, my lord, Mandarolin replied. By common usage, honorable men are morally obliged to defend the territory of kinsmen in their absence. There, Beric said to the Virgo. You see how it is. My friend here is an errand, and he's totally neutral in this matter. I think we'd have to accept his interpretation of the affair. Greldig's sailors had begun to climb the rigging by now, and they clung to the ropes with great evil, like great evil-looking apes, fingering their weapons and grinning at the Murgo. There is another way yet, the Murgo said ominously. Garion could feel a force beginning to build, and a faint sound seemed to echo inside his head. He drew himself up, putting his hands on the wooden rail in front of him. 
He felt a terrible weakness, but he steeled himself and tried to gather his strength. That's enough of that, Aunt Paul said crisply, coming up on deck with Dernick and Sinedra behind her. We were merely having a little legal discussion, Beric said innocently. I know what you were doing, she snapped. Her eyes were angry. She looked coldly across the intervening stretch at river at the Murgo. You'd better leave, she told him. I have something to retrieve first, the man in the boat called back. I'd forget about it. We'll see, he said. He straightened and began muttering as if to himself, his hands moving rapidly in a series of intricate gestures. Garion felt something pushing at him, almost like a wind, though the air was completely still. Be sure to get it right, Aunt Paul advised quietly. If you forget even the tiniest part of it, it'll explode in your face. The man in the boat froze, and a faintly worried frown crossed his face. The secret wind that had been pushing at Garion stopped. The man began again, his fingers weaving in the air and his face fixed with concentration. You do it like this, Grollum, Aunt Paul said. She moved her hand slightly, and Garion felt a sudden rush as if the wind pushing at him had turned and began to blow the other way. The Grollum threw his hands up and reeled back, stumbling and falling into the bottom of the boat, as if he had been given a heavy push, and the boat surged backwards several yards. The Grollum half raised, his eyes wide and his face deathly pale. Return to your master, dog, Aunt Paul said scathingly. Tell him to beat you for not learning your lessons properly. The Grollum spoke quickly to the Nyissans at the oars, and they immediately turned the boat and rowed back toward the slave ship. We had a nice little fight brewing there, Paul Gara, Barrett complained. Why did you have to spoil it? Grow up, she ordered bluntly. Then she turned on Garion, her eyes blazing and the white lock at her brow like a streak of fire. You idiot! You refuse any kind of instruction, and then you burst out like a raging bull. Have you the slightest conception of what an uproar translocation causes? You've alerted every Grollum in this tour to the fact that we're here. He was dying, Garion protested, gesturing helplessly at the slave lying on the wharf. I had to do something... He was dead as soon as he hit the water, she said flatly. Look at him. The slave had stiffened in an arched posture of mortal agony, his head twisted back and his mouth agape. He was obviously dead. What happened to him? Garion asked, feeling suddenly sick. The leeches are poisonous. Their bites paralyze their victims so they can feed on them undisturbed. The bites stopped his heart. You exposed us to Grollums for the sake of a dead man. He wasn't dead when I did it, Garion shouted at her. He was screaming for help. He was angrier than he had ever been in his life. He was beyond help. Her voice was cold, even brutal. What kind of monster are you? He asked from between clenched teeth. Don't you have any feelings? You would have just let him die, wouldn't you? I don't think this is the time or place to discuss it. No, this is the time. Right now, Aunt Paul. You're not even human. Did you know that? You left being human behind so long ago that you can't even remember where you lost it. You're 3,000 years old. Our whole lives go by while you blink your eyes. We're just an entertainment for you, an hour's diversion. You manipulate us like puppets for your own amusement. Well, I'm tired of being manipulated. You and I are finished. It probably went further than he'd intended, but his anger had finally run away with him, and the words seemed to rush out before he could stop them. She looked at him, her face as pale as if he had suddenly struck her. Then she drew herself up. You stupid boy, she said in a voice that was all the more terrible because it was so quiet. Finished? You and I? How can you even begin to understand what I've had to do to bring you to this world? You've been my only care for over a thousand years. I've endured anguish and loss and pain beyond your ability to understand what the words mean, all for you. I've lived in poverty and squalor for hundreds of years at a time, all for you. I gave up a sister I loved more than my life itself, all for you. I've gone through fire and despair worse than fire a dozen times over, all for you. And you think this has been an entertainment for me? Some idle amusement? 
You think that kind of care I've devoted to you for a thousand years and more comes cheaply? You and I will never be finished, Belgarian. Never! We will go on together until the end of days, if necessary. We will never be finished. You owe me too much for that. There was a dreadful silence. The others, shocked by the intensity of Aunt Paul's words, stood staring first at her, then at Garion. Without speaking further, she turned and went below decks. Garion looked around helplessly, suddenly terribly ashamed, and terribly alone. I had to do it, didn't I? He asked of no one in particular, and not entirely sure exactly what it was that he meant. They all looked at him, but no one answered his question.